Sorry, that was a bowling. Hello. Pin. That was a bowling pin. Yeah, the ukulele also went. Oh down. my god, look at that. Yeah, she probably shouldn't be on the desktop. Continue. I'm very sorry. Welcome to Inspiring Teachers, a show bringing you classroom tips, motivation, and stories from successful educators. Join Tavis Beam and Danny Hogger as they explore the why of teaching. And welcome to a very exciting episode 30 of Inspiring Teachers, three decades in the making. And you know what? Someone's career who's three decades in the making is joining us today. His coaching in the arts of dialect and accents have instructed, entertained, and enlightened us all. Dr. David Allen Stern was one of my first radio guests back in 2009 when I was just a wayward broadcaster at heart. At LearnAccent.com, David Allen Stern offers techniques for learning accents, voice and speech improvement, reducing regional accents, and a whole lot more. And between 1979 and today, his accent, I can speak as well, his accent and acting audiobooks have been used for training purposes around the world with systematic lessons, not just imitation. David Allen Stern is the master of speaking. Joshua Kala joins me as well. And David, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for taking 10 years off of my age. 30 oh, years. well, you know what? If we all think, could do that for each other, that would be good. I think it's about 43 years that I've been doing this now. I was kind of hoping I could borrow your 10 and put them on mine, right? But I wasn't going to tell you about that till later. I'm just going to put that in the description down below. But how have you been and what have you been working on lately? Well, I've been terrific. Uh, this, is, this is my first year. I hate to use the term retirement. It just means that I'm not teaching full-time at the University of Connecticut anymore. And I'm segueing back into the consulting and uh, the kinds of uh, production work and paying more attention to my educational materials uh, than I had before. So um, it's, um, it's, it's been a fun, a fun transition. That's wonderful. And how were uh, your classes going as well? Is it interesting to begin and not have to lesson plan as much? Is it changing your schedule around and how are you, uh, how are you enjoying that, that? Well, I'm definitely sleeping later. Okay. Uh, succeeded after a while in getting an, inv an invitation to use an office back on my old corridor if I need to get away from the house and get away from immediate access to either cable news or food uh, <laughs> to keep them from, from distracting me. But yeah, I mean, now that I'm, I'm doing um, Skype teaching uh, or Zoom teaching, distance uh, teaching, um, going in periodically to uh, productions, coach productions, uh, uh, more more time to do it away from UConn now than I uh, than I did before. That's phenomenal. Can you tell us because I don't think we got into really your origin of how you started down the road in education and even how you began being interested in dialects and accents. How did that begin for you? What was the impetus for that? Back in the day when I was a when I was a Hollywood dialect coach, whenever I was on a talk show and that question was typically the first question, I would really be a wiseacre and I would say. <laughs> In nineteen in in nineteen fifty, didn't every four year old Jewish kid in Brooklyn wake up one morning and say, "When I grow up, I want to teach people how to talk with accents in the movie"? <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, that's of course. It's reasonable. Uh, that's great. But uh, I, in tenth grade, I was in my first high school play. Of course, I wanted to be a professional actor. Majored in theater at the same university that I just retired from. Mm -hmm. uh, and all through high school and college, I was the one who usually got cast in the accent or dialect roles mm. because I was the one who could do them. I never learned them. I never put specific effort into any system. I, I, was, in a, I was a parrot. I was an accent parrot. Uh, you know, I'd hear, I mean, literally, my father brought home the original cast album of My Fair Lady in 1956 when it first opened. I was 10. Now you know how old I am. Doing the math. Uh, so Neither of us are yeah, math yeah, teachers no. here. We're going to yeah. have to get 70, a calculator 72. in. 72. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, he, he put the record on and I'd hear, oh, no, I won't. He's a room somewhere. And I went, oh, no, I won't. He, uh, Henry Higgins said, I find the moment I let a woman make friends with me. She becomes jealous. Exactly. And I would just repeat it. And then he pulled out the Finian's rainbow with the uh, bad Southern accent and the semi-good Irish accent. Uh, on that album, and I would imitate then, you know, whatever I heard, I imitated. It didn't matter whether it was good or bad or right or wrong. Um, about two thirds, three quarters of the way through college, I was studying to be an actor still. I decided that uh, I didn't have a thick enough hide to hmm. 
pursue a career where you um, applied for jobs every other day, every other week, and got turned down 99 times out of 100. So uh, I switched my focus, took a, crammed in four or five classes in speech in my senior year and applied for, uh, took a year off, sold pants, worked in politics, um, and then went to graduate school in uh, speech communication. Happened to be at Temple University at a department back then, not many have this model anymore, but back then a lot of speech departments had both speech communication or rhetoric and public address and speech pathology in the same department. So even though I wasn't majoring in speech pathology in grad school, there was crossover, there was interest there. Uh, my advisor, even though he was a rhetorician, was the co-author of voice and diction books. Long story short, my first job in a speech department, I was asked to create a voice and diction class. Hmm. And in the meantime, I'm still doing a little bit of acting out there in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, theater was in our same department. And one of the directors, wonderful director, a woman named Audrey Needles, said the fateful words to me one day in around 1975. You do accents so well, why don't you teach them to... Um, the cast of my play. Hmm. And the first attempt was dismal, <laughs> absolutely worthless, um, because I assumed that everyone was a parrot like me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not true. I mean, I would say, all I want is a room somewhere, and they'd parrot back, all I want is a room somewhere. <laughs> right. or, um, you know, maybe, oh, I don't know, 20%, 15% uh, of the actors that I was doing the modeling for were able to actually model it. And, and now to make another very long story short, there weren't many pedagogical materials back then in uh, the mid 70s in accents and dialects for, for actors. Uh, the ones that there were either made the same assumption I had, here it is, parrot it back, mm -hmm. or they gave you the pronunciation changes um, in phonetics, in international phonetic alphabet, which is a very important part of it. I mean, I, I don't uh, deny that. But even when I would write it out phonetically for those few students who had taken my voice and diction class and had learned phonetics, uh, I mean, I would write all I want is a, I can't write the phonetics for you right now, right. but there would be the phonetic symbols and they would correctly read them. And it would sound more like, well, I want is a room somewhere. And I basically at that point said, look, I'm my own best resource. I can switch from one accent to another accent, to another accent, to another accent, to another, you know, uh, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Well, here I am doing it. Let me go inside my own head, inside my own skull. I played around for days and weeks, closing my eyes, plugging up my ears, switching from one accent to another, saying to myself, what am I doing other than changing pronunciations? And what I eventually came to realize was that in almost every different speech pattern that I was doing, in addition to the changes in pronunciation, I was experiencing the placement or the vibration or the energy of the sound in a different part of the resonance cavity. Mm -hmm. So if I'm speaking, um, what for want of a better term, it used, we used to call it standard British. Mm -hmm. Hardly anyone speaks it anymore. So it's not standard anymore. It's an old style received pronunciation. And I was feeling the focus up here in front of my teeth, between my lips. But if I segued into more of a Cockney sound, mm -hmm. London Street accent, 
I realise now oh, there's nothing going on up here at all. I'm feeling it more on the back of my tongue between the rear tongue and the palate. And then if I switched into my own native language, 476 Willoughby Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. And there you go. Mm -hmm. That I so what am I doing here? I'm kind of this this cavity here right in front of the lower teeth. And for every one of these things, I'm creating it. I'm creating that placement by doing something different with the muscles of my mouth. Mm -hmm. For this New York, I'm doing what I call figuratively a gum chew. Hmm. This movement, one, two, three. For the received English, I'm mm -hmm. one, two, for the cockney, the tongue is sort of pumping down and it's focusing back here. One, mm -hmm. two, three, four. Uh, for uh, the, the accents of the German language, uh, uh, this strange sort of blowing of the air. A lot of people think German is guttural. It's just the sound of the R that's guttural, sometimes mm -hmm. the H. It's really placed more in the front. Uh, where I'm Blowing the air out the lower lip, like that, the um, French pulling back the uvula, the oh, the soft palate, and the uh, and the uvula. One, two, three, four, five. So I started playing around with this notion of for every accent that I was doing or trying to teach, of seeing whether first I could get the students to just imagine that they were shifting the focus or the resonance to a different part of the mouth. And then following up on that by giving them certain muscle exercises for that. And all of a sudden, actors who were saying, oh, I've tried all my life to do accents, I could never do them. And then I'm not saying in five or six minutes they had perfected it, that's absurd. Mm -hmm. But in five or six minutes, they were starting to make a tremendous change in what the, the features of the sound were. Mm -hmm. The positive thing was, the, the nice serendipitous thing was that in a lot of cases, some, certainly not all, some of the changes in vowel pronunciation were coming along with this. For example, uh, being from, uh, the Eastern part of the United States, speaking mm -hmm. kind of an Eastern non-regional accent, I pronounce the long O. O, O, it's a diphthong. One, two, three, go home. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing one, two, three, if I'm saying initiate everything with the tongue gliding forward and the lips gliding forward, one, two, three, go up. I'm, st I'm not doing it anymore. One, two, three, go home. And now I have that triple vowel. O, O, the short O. Hot, pot. Right up here with the lip movement. Mm. Hot, hot. The, um, the aw sound, the short, uh, the, um, what's called the, the thought vowel in, in the system. Or oh, I thought I saw the tall author coming forward. And um, I mean, I wish every single pronunciation change could be generated out of this resonance change or muscular change. It doesn't. You still have to learn the pronunciation. You still have to work on it. Well, that all worked really, really beautifully until I got to try to teach some accents where it hardly worked at all. Hmm. And uh, Joshua, you had talked uh, before we started uh, the cameras rolling about um, American Southern accent. Mm -hmm. Well, these resonance changes, I mean, there are so many sub-regions of American Southern accent. I mean, somebody right. says, I need to learn a Southern accent. I say, which <laughs> one? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you, you have my father-in-law's accent. One, two, West Texas, one, two, three, four, five. Go over to the other side of Texas, one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Go into the Dallas area, one, two, three, four, five. So those resonance changes are taking place all over the South. My uh, 
my my mother is from northern alabama my father is from south georgia and whenever my wife my my wife is from california mm-hmm. she like she really likes to analyze their two different accents cuz oh, they sure. sound they they don't sound like they're from the same place at all well, right? it's it was, completely it was, different it was the same thing my father-in-law was from uh um uh, West Texas and my my mother in law was from East Texas. It's the same state, different yeah. different accents. But, mm-hmm. but what's so the question then becomes what makes Southern Southern? Well, it's mm-hmm. not these resonances, it's not these placements hmm. because you can change it seventeen times and still mm-hmm. be Southern. It's an inflection. It's a lilt. You can think of it as a pitch change. There, uh, general American has a flat vowel one. Mm-hmm. Two, you might change pitch between them. Good morning. I'm very happy to see you. But each one is very happy in the South. One, mm-hmm. two, three, four. Morning. I'm very happy to see you now. Mm-hmm. How y'all doing? Um, the size of that lilt is different from one part of the South to another. Mm-hmm. There's always that little bit of a lilt. Now, of course, I lied when I said it's a pitch change. It can be done with a pitch change. Most Southerners do it with a pulsation, getting mm-hmm. louder and softer. One, two, mm-hmm. three, four. Some do it together. One, two, three. There's a European language that has a very similar lilt, and its accent has a very similar lilt when someone's speaking English, but it's a different resonance. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. I never thought about that. Mm-hmm. It, and and then, Swedish, right? It, yeah. So, well, mm-hmm. it's actually it's, uh, northern Scandinavian. Northern okay. Sweden. Uh, mo- uh, you hear it more in Norway and in, okay. in northern Sweden. Um, and other accents have these inflections that if you're not you and, and it's not just copying the inflections. It's using them to make points. So, for example, if someone tries to do a southern accent and they just do the <laughs> lift on every other sound, right? It's gonna sound like the stupidest thing on the face of the earth. Mm. It becomes a tool of expressiveness. If a southerner says, "I don't want you to do that," mm-hmm. then they're making that inflection bigger to make the point just like um you know these these lilts or inflections uh irish for example southern irish a downward inflection one two three (laughs) four falls off northern irish and scottish the opposite one two (laughs) interesting or make it scottish one two three right now, um, do you do any, any, any kind of cross-curricular study here where you're talking about the mechanics of the language, but also maybe something, something more anthropological where you're, you're finding um, a connection between the accent itself and maybe the surrounding culture with it? I know with the Southern dialect, we talk a lot, and this is just in the context of the novel we're doing, The Eyes Are Watching God. Sure. There's, there's much more of a kind of a, a relaxed feel to it. Right. The the mechanics are very slow, but also the culture is very relaxed as well. Well, but but the point the point that you're making is is very applicable to a specific region, a specific area, a specific culture. But you can't use Southern as the catch all for that. That's true. Because more than Florida, because, because you got you know you got your your mountain sorts of things where it's in you know, an inch of burden and all this sort of thing like that, and then you've got your expressive app going sorts of mm-hmm. uh, of southern sounds. There are many, many uh, stage accents, stage dialect teachers who spend an enormous amount of time. Um, dealing with exactly the kinds of uh, sociological anthropological things that you were that you were talking about um and a lot of the training materials spend a lot of time talking about that um just a few years into doing this i started pulling away from that Hmm. because i realized that if you were dealing with actors yeah there were some things that might be considered universal 
But I didn't want to impose choices about individual characters and those individual characters' relationships onto the actors on the basis of making some amorphous generality mm -hmm. about what the people in that region would generally be like, because especially because uh, characters in the scripts of plays are not living the average day in their life and they're not the average person from that, uh, mm -hmm. that area either. So I, um, going back for a minute to uh, my native speech, New York <laughs> accent. Uh, and a lot of people think that New Yorkers sound unintelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, New York has a very heavily muscularized um, articulation. But, and some people think that New Yorkers are assertive and aggressive and everything like that. And if I start telling actors to make those assumptions about the characters, mm -hmm. then you're not going to be able to have a shy sense. Mm -hmm. Your character says, uh, um, so I'm, I'm going out with this girl for the first time. And mm -hmm. We're going to the movies and as usual, um, I'm throwing out my breadcrumbs so I can find my way home because I have this bad sense of direction you know um uh, so th that issue that, that, that you bring up is right in the crosshairs of an awful lot of accent and dialect teachers mm -hmm. um i don't spend nearly as much time with it as some of my uh my colleagues do. i think i think it's a valid point that you make Especially when, you, like you said, with theater, where the characters are not going to be typical a lot of times. There, there, there's something special about the character, and so you can't, you can't uh, put them in the general culture. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I do make some generalizations. Uh, back in the, if you have a character who is speaking received pronunciation, you have a character mm -hmm. like George Bernard Shaw play the opera. I mean, he has lo he has lower class characters as well. Mm -hmm. But then I will I will say to them, if Shaw is writing these writing these lines, and if the character comes from this received language background, then this character is a word user, a word sculptor, mm -hmm. someone who takes joy in wallowing in the act of creating words and creating language. That still doesn't mean that everyone has to be snooty or self-conscious about it because mm -hmm. this this is the character choice that so many actors make when they start to play anything with a received english accent rather than just being basically very similar to the person i am very similar to the person who is just talking to you but i'm using my mouth in a different way mm -hmm. to uh, create the sound um, you, you, you used the word received a few times there. Is, does that have a special meaning? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and it's, and, and, and it's, uh, it's nickname. Most people call it RP, received mm -hmm. pronunciation. Uh, received pronunciation, or cultured English of the early 20th century, late, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, BBC standard, all that sort of thing. Um, it didn't come from any region. It was actually mm -hmm. created. And um, once the BBC decided that that was going to be the standard sound mm -hmm. for radio when it first started, it, beca it then became the marker of upward social and professional mobility mm -hmm. in England. So if you had a lower class accent, a working class accent, a heavy, you know, they come from Yorkshire and got a, got a heavy mm -hmm. accent from up in the north country there. Um, in order to have, to like move down to London and have upward mobility and work, one had to receive right. that speech style. And of course, you could receive it in if you went to public school, which is mm -hmm. what we call private school, <laughs> in mm -hmm. boarding school uh, in England. But very much the, the line in the musical of Pygmalion, My Fair Lady, um, where um, 
Henry Higgins says, uh, why can't the English teach their children how to speak? This verbal class distinction <laughs> by now should be antique. That was his proposition that everyone should, if everyone spoke properly, then the class distinctions would disappear. <laughs> I wonder, in the series of audio recordings and sets and teaching that you, it's just one of the many things that you do, do you approach them all at zero, at the same level as you are working and approaching and analyzing and deducing, or are there some that you enjoyed teaching and learning and directing and experiencing more than others, or are they all equal in your mind because it is one task like the other? No, they're they're certainly not equal in my heart. Uh, there are some there are some accents that I'm called on to teach a lot that d didn't come quite as easily to me. Uh, that I have to give myself a refresher course on <laughs> before uh, before I teach them. There are others. I mean, like. RP received received British um, is is just a joy, even though no one speaks it anymore. About three mm. percent of the population of England speaks uh, RP now. Uh, there are some that are difficult for me, but it was such a joy for me to learn them. The first accent that I had to teach myself, I couldn't imitate it. Could not imitate. It. I had to analyze it mm. using my system. What's happening with the resonance? What's <laughs> happening with the inflections? Was Northern Irish. Hmm. Uh, I'll do a, a, a drill passage. You wanted to know all about my grandfather? Well, he's nearly 93 years old. He dresses himself in an ancient black frock coat, usually minus several buttons, but he still thinks as swiftly as ever. Well, you know, it's got this upward inflection. It's got a kind of a, a carping harsh resonance to it and if if an actor simply does you know you watch all about my grandfather he's really 93 hours old he dresses himself and that's what you hear a lot <laughs> in belfast and Derry and uh, donegal which is part of the republic but it's still a northern northern accent so i get such joy with that accent in the, the challenge of teaching it to actors and teaching them how to not 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 to just do the repetition for the sake of the repetition and to use to use the characteristics of it to make points to 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 connect and get points across rather than rah 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 you know um one that i have uh of the ones that i have been called on to teach a lot cajun <laughs> is the one that I'm almost starting from square one every time I approach it, if more than three days has gone by since I've, <laughs> since I've uh, done it last. Um, that's the, you know, Louisiana, mm -hmm. Louisiana French. Um, but um, in, in terms, in terms, in terms of putting the, putting the training materials together, um yeah there there are some that were absolute total labors of love and there were others that i just had to labor mm. in order to you know still needed to put the same creativity and the same uh analytical uh skills into it but um certainly not as uh, not as enjoyable Okay, just a, a couple more questions. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Go to learnaccent.com and find all the vast resources that are available. What was the why of teaching? That's a common question on our show. You could have performed your whole life. You could have voiced over and, and launched your own career and just done it as a profession and not sought the aspect of education. What was the, the journey through why you decided to start teaching it to others? Because you had it naturally. Well. The year after I graduated from college, uh, I had actually, and I decided to leave theater forever at that point. I um, first went to Washington 
to try to work in the civil service. I thought that would be a fun thing to do, but it was the very first year of the Nixon administration. Everything was being cut. Uh, nothing was available. I went back to my hometown, New London, Connecticut, after we, you know, that was where we ended up after Brooklyn. And the, the pivotal moment was I was, um, went to an employment agency and was the guy was talking to me about you know what kinds of jobs were available why didn't we talk we had a great chat and he looked at me after about 15 minutes and said listen to me what kind of job am i going to get you another job selling pants like you just had manager of a of a hardware store if you learn that he said Come on, I've been with you 15 minutes. You are a teacher. Don't you know that yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's neat. And that was when I realized that I would have, was already interested in going to graduate school in speech. And what do you do if you go to graduate school in speech? You become a speech teacher. Mm -hmm. But the minute I stepped into the classroom of my assistantship, I realized this is where I belong. That's pretty amazing. And we had written back and forth a little bit about discussing what makes a good teacher, a captivating teacher, a motivating and inspiring teacher. That was the, you see what I did there. Yeah. 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 So what, what is that for you? What's your style in the classroom? Cause I've heard your audio programs and I know what that style is like. How do you do your, I want to see your act because almost in well, a way we are all a bit of a performer in the classroom yeah, in a way look, that we're not, look, right? You don't need to apologize for having used that terminology at all because when I'm working with business and professional speakers, clergy, classroom teachers who are perceived as being boring, I mean, typically they're going along and they're talking at one pitch, at a monotone, not differentiating concepts, ideas, not using their voices to frame the word, not using their voices to discover, to, to frame, to not using the syllables to like connect. So it's basically a case of trying to, teachers who are, who are trying to be more, more dynamic, it's a case of using the language to seem like you're discovering ideas in the moment and and connecting with and explaining and, and um and this is um that's another one of my passions uh uh trying to get teachers to be more animated and more dynamic in the classroom i, I think it's funny that you said that because um, sometimes I feel like such a hypocrite because I totally do that where I, I pause and say, it's like, and I know what it's like, you know, I know exactly what it's like. I know exactly what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it, but they don't, you know, and I feel so bad about that sometimes. So you, can, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to actors about this and I say, pause and let the character discuss discover the next mm -hmm. word, the new pitch. And they'll buy that for a while and then they'll say, but wait a minute, there are some things I don't have to discover. Like you were just saying, I know it is good. Then I say, okay, you can either discover something at a new pitch or you can hold off for a second or two before you reveal it. Mm -hmm. That's that's powerful, and I teach history, and Josh teaches English, and I think that can be so useful. Another thing that I just love doing is the silly version of, of going, I can often think in two tracks, and we'll be talking about what we're talking about, and I'll stop and say, hey, look at that speaker. You know, I got those speakers about two years ago. They're pretty good. I mean, they're industry standard, but they're smaller than I'd like. And then I circle back around, and they're not sure what happened, but you ran a circle around them, and you're on track, but you just had a moment of fun but that produced so much joy in the moment and, and and having a good time hearing it that I caught everyone's attention again, lassoed them. And now here we are in my hand again, and we can proceed Absolutely. forward. Right. That is something that no matter how many times a day, and you can't always produce it unnaturally. Sometimes it needs to come from the moment is such a wonderful feeling mm -hmm. that I, I love that. Um, my last question, because you've been so fantastic and generous with your time is, do you hear anyone speaking that's a public figure, a notable figure, and think that their accent is something that they've created on their own, or it's just so unique and, and identifiable that you wonder, how do they get there? You know, how did they develop that? I, 
I'm not sure I could come up with anything on on this on this side of the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of what maybe one example would be more of signal switching or accent switching. Um, President Obama, who of course did not grow up speaking African American dialect in any way, shape, or form, tended in some situations to fall into that Southern Baptist preacher um, uh, rhythm when he was uh, when he was talking to to certain crowds, which which clearly worked. Um, one thing that's happened, you know, as as the estuary accent, this sort of halfway between the old received pronunciation and Cockney, has become more of the standard accent in England. Some politicians who actually grew up being quite quite posh, mm-hmm. very consciously started to put in some block stops, mm-hmm. and started to let some of those Cockney vowels come in, um, and because they're nobody in their intended audience anymore uh, is speaking that cultured posh accent that they grew up with. Hmm. Very interesting. And is there a a favorite person who, if they're on your TV as you're walking by, you have to stop and listen to? Maybe it's an actor or a broadcaster that you just really enjoy the way they speak? Probably Hugh Grant. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it seems a classic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, another favorite, uh, when he's speaking with his own accent rather than the 200 others that he puts on is one of my students from years and years and years and years and years ago, uh, Liam Neeson, mm-hmm. who actually has a cultured version of that Northern Irish accent. Is he one of the better mainstream actors that you can think of? And I know you've worked with him as well who you just think does a really remarkable job in preparing for roles. And uh, if you had never heard him speak, you'd be impressed by. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are so grateful for your teaching, for your passion, for sparking uh, in what you do for your students. And well, and we're, thank we're you, very grateful. Thank you, thank you for doing what you're doing. I've uh, taken a look at a bunch of these podcasts oh, thank uh, you. recently, and they're uh, really, really valuable. Oh, well, thank you very much. I hope that it will be sort of the anti-burnout for teachers who can <laughs> realize how much they really are impacting the world. And I admire you because you you have a bit of the self-made that I love in mm-hmm. people's stories, but you're just really enjoyable to listen to. So thank you for everything that you've made and produced. And it's going to stand for such a long time that I'll hope in, in the length of my whatever career it is, and we talk about this, where will we be? What will we be doing? Oh, yeah. um, that I hope I have just the, the little glimmer of the lilt. I want a lilt in the career of David Allen Stern. How about that? We talk a lot about lilt. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for being an inspiring teacher. And for everyone who's listening, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and go to learnaccent.com to see more about David Allen Stern. And for now, class is dismissed.